Theatrical Shenanigans Special. Hello there, a very happy new year to you and welcome to this Theatrical Shenanigans Special and I hope you're all well. I can hardly believe I'm saying this, but this episode marks the one year anniversary since the start of Theatrical Shenanigans back on New Year's Day 2023. Since then, we have produced 20 different plays and spoken to 20 different guests in our main series, as well as providing you with a four-part crime drama series back in May 2023, our series of 12 mini shenanigans over the summer, six monthly episodes of our panel show, The Panel Presents, and most recently, our full-length Christmas special production. So it's safe to say we've kept busy over the last year. To celebrate our anniversary, I've put together something a little special for you. Over this special, you'll hear several short plays written by playwrights and guests we've had on the show this past year, as well as some very kind messages from them. So to start with, I thought I'd get the ball rolling with a short piece written by me, entitled The Turning of the Seasons, which sees Beth and her grandfather bonding over leaves on an otherwise very sad day. Theatrical Shenanigans presents The Turning of the Seasons by Rachel Feeney Williams. Hey, hey. What's all this now? Nothing. Mm. Uh, Doesn't look like nothing. Have the leaves upset you in some way? Leaves can't upset people, Grandpa. Oh, now that's just not true. It's not? Nope. Leaves upset me all the time. Why? Well, in the spring they come, they look so beautiful and green, make you think of everything's gonna be all right. Your grandma was like a leaf in spring. She was? Mm Mm-hmm. She swept into my life one day on the most... Beautiful spring day. She was wearing a green dress, too, so she looked like a leaf. Really? I'd never lie to you, baby girl. It was on the day I met your grandma that I knew I would always love spring. That's why we got married in the spring. It's why we have that big party at the start of spring every year. I was born in spring, too. (laughs) That you were. And that's why your grandma and I love you so much. Does she still love me? (sighs) Of course. Why would you ask such a thing? Because she's gone. Don't that mean she'll forget me? Oh, baby girl. Your grandma will never forget you or stop loving you. But how do you know? (laughs) Well, it's like the leaves. Huh? In spring and summer, they're always there. Always beautiful and green and reminding us of the beautiful days we have ahead. But then, when the autumn comes, they lose their color. They aren't around so much anymore. Like Grandma, when she got sick? Yeah, just like that. But the leaves, they aren't just leaves on their own. They're part of something amazing and beautiful. Like the trees and and the parks and... Well, the countryside, even the whole world. So Grandma is part of something big now. (laughs) You bet. But you know something? What? Her beautiful spring green self may have gone, but she's always going to be watching you. Really? You bet. When you go to the park or the countryside or or wherever you see some leaves swirling around, that's her. (laughs) <laughs> That's Grandma. <laughs> you bet, baby girl. <laughs> oh, now what's this sad face? I miss her, Grandpa. I know you do. I do, too. But she's never far away. It smells like Grandma. That's how you know. So, how about we go and get some ice cream, huh? I love 
you too, baby. That was The Turning of the Seasons by Rachel Feeney Williams, with Darren Ingram as Albert and Jackie Priscorn as Beth. Hi, this is Jacqueline Priscorn, and you're about to hear my little play, Hell Job. I just have to say that theatrical shenanigans has been a gift, not only to playwrights, but also to voice actors around the world. It's a wonderful opportunity to share our artistry with others. And thank you, Rachel, for your dedication and your work ethic is unsurpassed. The way you crank these out is just mind boggling. Please keep up the good work. Theatrical Shenanigans presents Hell Job by Jackie Briscorn. So, <laughs> how long have you been in your current position? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you guys don't really have uh, calendars around here. And why do you think you would be a good candidate for this position? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I have a lot of new ideas and... <laughs> new ideas? Look, 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 look. Uh, the world doesn't need new ideas. What it needs is someone to make the old ideas actually work. Well, when my friend Carl had the job, he got to invent the platypus. I thought that was pretty fun. Fun? Yeah. I mean, it's kept humans pretty confused for ages. First of all, Hope, the position of head deity isn't fun. Second, Carl had special clearance back then because he had creationist training. Your training stops at, um, Second City Improv Level 2. I couldn't afford Level 3. Uh-huh. Ezra, I'm going to be direct and to the point with you, okay? Okay. I need this job. I mean, I really need this job. I understand. Do you? Do you? Um... This being just an angel crap is killing me. <laughs> well, to be fair, you... Aren't alive. Ha ha. You know what this place needs? A bar. The other office gets a bar. Well, their CEO actually likes them. It's always so hot around here. Well, duh. I I'm just saying, if I were in charge, things would be... Okay, Hope. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. No one else really wants this job. Really? Why not? Well, it's not really a position of power, per se. Head deity isn't a position of power? <laughs> There's a lot of bad press associated with our organisation. Right now, we're just in clean-up mode. You'd be head of operations, sure, but all that means is you're the face to put the blame to in these troubled times. Blame? Exactly. Well, that sounds like a lot of pressure. It, it, it is. But people will call me head deity. Around this office, yes. Can, can I just blow some shit up and watch people blame each other until it's all over? <laughs> now that's thinking outside the box. If you want the job, I can show you a good oil platform in the ocean you could start with. This job is gonna be hell. That was Hell Job by Jackie Priscorn, with Andy Duncan as Ezra and Megan Bickle as Hope. Hi, my name is John David Brown, and I had the great privilege of being featured on the first season of Theatrical Shenanigans with my short play, Fun. Rachel and the actors she worked with did such an incredible job, and I can't say how thrilling it was to hear the scene come to life. It was an honor to have been included among so many wonderful writers, including Rachel herself, who has probably written more plays than anyone I have ever met. It's ridiculous. 
The scene you're about to hear is called Rest Ye Merry, and it's taken from my play, The Songs We Sing at Funerals, which is currently being workshopped by the Greenlight Acting Studio here in Atlanta, where I live. As you might guess, the scene takes place at a funeral, um, and that's because I'm very interested in people who are in a situation that normally requires them to lie and suppress their complicated, ugly emotions, but they instead choose to tell the truth. That's the idea that inspired this scene and this play, and I hope you enjoy it. Theatrical Shenanigans presents Rest You Merry by John David Brown. Who else would die on Christmas? Do you think she did it on purpose? Honestly? 100%? It's too perfect to be an accident. She's like the opposite of Santa Claus and Jesus. You know, if you think about it, this is actually the best present she ever gave us. <sighs> so what did you write for the eulogy? Oh, I didn't. You're not doing it? Who's doing it? N no, I'm doing it. I just haven't written it. It's in an hour. What are you going to say? Oh, well, maybe I'll just say I loved her and I'll miss her and be done. Can I tell you something insane? Go on. I think... I think I did love her. Well, that is insane. Did you? <sighs> Probably. Maybe I'll just sing Joy to the World. Or... It's the most wonderful time of the year. What about this? Today we've come together to honour the life of my mother. She was a strong woman. Good start. She faced many difficulties, from a years-long battle with cancer to the private struggles of her own mental health. Oh, yeah. Let them know without letting them know. <clears throat> She faced these difficulties with a resolve that can only be defined as... steely. Are we making her sound too good? She died on Christmas, a day she truly hated. There it is. She did, however, leave many gifts to us, her children. She gave us the gift of self-awareness, specifically in the areas where we needed improvement. She gave us the gift of self-reliance, teaching us that the people closest to us would inevitably let us down. She gave us the gift of self-sabotage for reasons anyone with a narcissistic parent would find obvious. Don't use that one. Mother, I loved you and I miss you. May God rest ye merry. On behalf of our family, we hope everyone here today had a holly jolly Christmas. It's perfect. Everyone will hate it. After this, we'll never see them again. And we'll never see her again. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. That was Rest You Merry by John David Brown, with Perdita Lawson as Kate and Nikki Wachello as Jamie. Hi, I'm Jack Rushton coming to you from Massachusetts. I want to wish theatrical shenanigans a very happy first anniversary. Way to go, Rachel. I had the great fortune of having my play Remembering Elizabeth as episode two in season two. And the play you're about to hear is called The Institute of Love, which I wrote especially for this wonderful occasion. Rachel, thank you for all you do and for supporting playwrights around the world. Congratulations. Theatrical Shenanigans presents The Institute of Love by Jack Rushton. I'm sorry, Mr. Simmons, but this is our last session, and as soon as we're finished, you are out of here. What? Why? De-institutionalize me? Please, don't. You need to get back out there. Doctor, you can't. I love it here. The Institute of Love has been my best place ever. It's safe here. 
I intend to stay. We've already put you through all the tests. Five times. You are a hopeless romantic. It's a serious condition and in your case quite incurable. But it's not like it's terminal. We've tried everything. Oh, come on. Surely there's another test I can take? Or a study? Yeah, how about a long-term study? You know how I love studies. You're screwing up our data. Most people respond to our treatments, but either you can't, as in you are not capable, or there is some set of circumstances in your past which is so hidden that it's like an invisible hand. I've told you about all my heartbreaks. Ad infinitum. All the loves I've lost. Please don't start again. And I still believe, you know, that true love is out there somewhere. Just like the Holy Grail. You are on a quest. The Holy Grail is a myth. And I just know I'm going to try to find it again. But I'm not ready yet. And... I'm still afraid. Of what? That I might actually find it. True love. The grail of all grails. Yes. Mr. Simmons, the Institute of Love is not about finding true love. We're about helping you cope with love. And love takes a lot of coping. There are so many shapes and sizes of love, so many colours of love, so many dimensions to love. We teach you all of its languages and all of its meanings. But the one thing we all know is this. True love does not exist. It's another myth. Are you finished? I can be if you want me to be. True love is unconditional love. Ah, for fuck's sake. You are in love with the idea of being in love. And because... Every other love you've ever had has only ended up disappointing you. That should be proof enough that your expectations are way too high. There is no such thing as unconditional love. So, you are being released. Godspeed, stop trying to find it, and maybe, if you're lucky, human love will find you. Human love is not true love, blah, blah, blah. And it's sure as shit, not unconditional love. <clears throat> love is flawed, very, very flawed. And it needs a lot of forgiveness to exist and to survive. Think of the North Star, Doctor. Always there, always shining. Just because it's cloudy out doesn't mean it's gone away. We can agree on this. You can't see love, and the most powerful things in the universe are the things you can't see. You can't see fear, either. Maybe you should be calling me a fearful romantic instead of a hopeless one, because there's one thing I'll always have. Hope. You have definitely been one of our most interesting patients, Mr. Simmons. But here at the Institute of Love, we only have so many resources. Think of it this way. Your departure frees us to help someone else who we might actually help. Farewell. That's it? What's for dinner tonight? Last night's chicken was pretty awful, just saying. You won't be here for dinner. Oh, come on. How about a last meal before I face the firing squad? On one condition. Are you listening? You can't just fall in love with everyone you meet. So when you're out there... Let love find its way to you, then let it in. I'll grant you this, it's all around us and as perennial as the grass. Spoken like a real romantic. I love you, Doctor. I love you too, in a practical human way. Now get the hell out of here. Same time tomorrow? Not a chance. But you know what? I'm going to do you one last favour. Medication? I don't want any. You could call it that. It's my sister's number. Call her. What? Why? She's a handful and she's a lot like you. No way! Yes way. And maybe I'll see you at a holiday dinner or something, if you don't blow it. Thank you, Doctor. Don't thank me yet. You've given me a fresh start. And hope. Now, will you get out of here, please? Okay. Bye-bye, then. Good luck. Bye-bye.
That was The Institute of Love by Jack Rushton, with Heather Dalton as Doctor and Tony Targan as Mr. Simmons. Hi, I'm Greg Hatfield, a playwright from Cincinnati, Ohio. First, I'd like to thank Rachel Feeney Williams for allowing me to be part of theatrical shenanigans and congratulate her on the one year anniversary of the podcast. Her support of playwrights cannot be understated. In addition to the podcast, she also runs a Playwrights Facebook group in which playwrights can discuss theater business, practices, and discover opportunities for productions. Rachel does all this and writes plays too. Her own body of work is very impressive. The scene you're going to hear is from my play, Henry Irving's Hamlet Script is Missing. It's a small scene from a play about the Cabot family, the first family of American theater, and yes, it is based on the Barrymores. I've written several plays about the Cabots. Each character has become alive for me, and it's fun writing about their lives in the theater, because that's all they know. The parents grew up in and around the theater, playing every part imaginable. Their children learned from them and carried on the family tradition. My Cabot plays have been published by Next Stage Press in the collection The Cabot Comedies, one-act plays featuring the first family of American theater. While the play itself revolves around a missing Hamlet script that may or may not have been stolen, there is a subplot involving Virginia Cabot, the mother of the family, and her daughter, Veronica, who has come to her with the news that she has taken her first theatrical part, thus continuing further the family's dynasty on stage. So, without further ado, please enjoy this scene from Henry Irving's Hamlet script is missing. Theatrical Shenanigans presents Henry Irving's Hamlet Script is Missing by Greg Hatfield Well, Mother, I've done it. I've done it, I tell you. Oh, Veronica, what have you done? Oh, thank you for asking, Mother. I've got a part in Ted Lucas's new play. Oh, that's wonderful, dear. Tell me more. I'd love to. I had an audition today at the Lyceum Theater. Why, Veronica, isn't that the theater where your father and I worked oh so many years ago? Yes, it is. I read for Ted Lucas for his next play, which he's directing. I was so nervous. He was very nice. Of course, he mentioned you and sends his best. After I'd read, he asked me to wait and talk to some people in the audience. Then he offered me the part. What did you read? Excuse me? <clears throat> what did you read? I read Juliet's speech from Act 2, Scene 2. And yet, I wish but for the thing I have. Yes. My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. That's so beautiful. It's one of my favorite scenes. The great actress Julia Marlowe played Juliet in 1904. What I wouldn't give to have seen her. Did I ever tell you the story of how she came to the stage? Only a million times, but tell it to me again. Julia Marlowe was born in England in the late 19th century. When Julia was four, her father got involved in an incident with another man who accused Julia's father of flicking his eye out with a whip. How that happened is lost to history. As you can imagine, the man demanded restitution, a staggering amount in those days for an eye. You know, times were hard then. Money was scarce. Julia's father had no money. The wronged man cornered the father and told him that he could either pay up or he would take his daughter as payment. The horror 
that father must have felt. I can't even. The father was distraught. He didn't know what to do. He went to the church seeking guidance. Father, father, help me, he cried to the priest. What is it, my son? The priest replied. The man I injured is after me. He wants my money. If he doesn't get it, he'll take my child as payment. The priest thought. He reached into his purse and gave Julia's father two gold coins. This will stall him for a little, but he will never be satisfied until he has Julia. Bring her to me, and I will help her escape. That is the only way. Julia's father gives the money to the man, and he's satisfied for the moment. The priest arranges for Julia to escape to America, where she becomes the greatest Shakespearean actress of her time. I love that story. Even if none of it's true, it gets better every time you tell it. My sisters told me that story years ago. They gave me my love of Shakespeare. I was 14 then, the same age as Julia Marlowe when she began her acting career. The perfect age to play Juliet. But I wouldn't play her until I was an old woman of 24. Thank you for telling it to me. That was Henry Irving's Hamlet Script is Missing by Greg Hatfield, with Angela Sarabia as Virginia and Jackie Priscorn as Veronica. Thank you for supporting theatrical shenanigans. What Rachel Feeney Williams has created here is truly special. We are a community brought together by the power of storytelling. We represent so many places, yet come together with a singular purpose. Thank you, Rachel, and all the talented creatives involved in bringing these stories to life. And Rachel, thank you for all the time and attention you put into these pieces. You're a champion of playwrights, a fabulous writer, and your support is unmatched. I'm thrilled to present to you my short, spooky play, Boogeyman, by Dana Hall. They say the boogeyman is your conscience, the voice holding you back. But sometimes it's the very thing that you try to convince yourself isn't happening at all. Sometimes fear is a warning. Sometimes you should listen. Welcome to this first date to remember. Theatrical Shenanigans presents Boogeyman by Dana Hall. Wow, it's dark already. I guess the movie ran longer than we thought. Here we are. Let me get that for you. Oh, thank you. I thought Chivalry was dead. No, maybe on life support, but definitely alive and well with this guy. Get in before the boogeyman gets you. <laughs> you know, as a kid, I tell myself not to believe in things like the boogeyman. I thought all kids had that rite of passage. Not me. How'd you get around that? Logic. If I felt something lurking in the dark... I'd turn on all the lights and check the closet. I'd repeat to myself it was just my imagination. That's what scares people the most. Their own wild imaginations. Well, I'd like to thank you and your imagination for a lovely first date. It's been so long since I went to the movies. It's crazy, isn't it? The cost of these damn tickets, yes. It's insane. No, that people go to these movies wanting to be afraid. It's exciting. It gives you a thrill. You feel that rush of adrenaline around you. Now, the Psycho Stalker is a cult classic. And he's not a slasher. He torments his victims methodically by making them think that they're going insane. He knows everything about them and uses that to build trust before he kills. <laughs> it's brilliant, really. Come on. We're supposed to believe these women never see it coming? People are surprisingly trusting. Or maybe they just think they're smarter than everyone else. Until they realize they've been outsmarted. And then it's too late. Damn, where's my phone? 
Look at the time. Speaking of late, we should get going. I have to be up early, and I barely slept last night. Why? What happened? It's silly. Nothing. It's silly. I woke up, and I felt like someone was watching me. I know it sounds crazy. Don't judge me. <laughs> It's understandable. You live alone. Did you check it out to make sure? I turned on all the lights. No one was there. I guess even adults have overactive imaginations. Did you actually see a person? A shadow? Anything? No. No, I couldn't make anything out. I just woke up and I couldn't move. I was frozen. It was so dark. I could just see the alarm. 2.32 a.m. Next thing I know, I turn my head and it's 5.43 a.m. And it was gone. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. I read about that. Did he say anything? He? <laughs> no, no one was there. It must have been one of those lucid dreams or something. It was bizarre. Felt so real. See? I don't need horror movies. I have my own. Well, <laughs> It sounds terrifying. It was. I read that it can happen, though. It's like you're awake, but in a dream. Next time, you should keep your phone on the stand next to the bed. Not all the way across the room. Yeah, I've been meaning to move the charger. Never know when you might need it. True. Wait, did I tell you about that? And fix the window latch. What? What's the matter? How do you know those things? The stand, and... and the window. You were there. It was you. Took you long enough. No. No, it wasn't. It couldn't have been. Let me out! Help! Let me out! Help! <laughs> Maybe you should start believing in the boogeyman. That was Boogeyman by Dana Hall, with Robert Sawyer as Matt and Perdita Lawton as Whitney. I'm John Patrick Bray, and I wrote Old Lang Syne. Theatrical Shenanigans has become a wonderful and welcoming playground, pioneered by Rachel Feeney Williams, who brings us together joyously celebrating both the community and professional spirit of theatrical creation. I'm humbled to be a part of the Theatrical Shenanigans family. Happy anniversary. Theatrical Shenanigans presents Old Lang Syne by John Patrick Bray. Welcome to Ohioville Liquors. Yes, I want to return this. Return this? Yes. You can't return bottles of champagne. I have the receipt. Here. This is today's date, January 2nd. Last year. You kept this bottle for a year? Yes. And you don't want it? No. I, I can't take it back. Why, why don't you gift it? Because I wouldn't want to wish this year's bad luck on anyone. I bought this bottle when the year ahead was filled with hope, possibilities. I thought I'd open it on New Year's Eve while looking back on the year that was with a sort of wistful nostalgia. But I look back at the year that was, the death of friends, my kids growing distant, especially after my wife and I. It started with her saying that we should have separate health insurance. I should have known then. We'll save on premiums, she said. Every way, shape, and form last year was a disaster, and I don't want to think of it. And you thought you'd bring that disaster here? No. If I return it, it's like hitting reset. Maybe I'll get the year back. The missed opportunities, the missed signals, the missed anything I missed. 
That's really too bad. Maybe I can exchange it for something else. Something that could get the ball rolling on this year. We don't do exchanges either. What do I do with it then? What? Mm, pour it out? No. You really don't want it? No, I don't. Okay. What are you doing? Taking one for the team. I, I can't legally let you return it, and you don't want to gift it, so I'm drinking it. Right here in front of you. You think that will cure the bad luck? Do you have any idea how long it's since I've had champagne? I, I try not to drink as a rule. Look where I work. Sure, I see happy, celebrating faces a few times a year, but mostly it's drunks. People who are addicted. Lost. Sad. So I avoid the stuff. But if it means so much to you to get rid of it, eh. You're... you're drinking it all! Yep! Save some for me! I do have a couple glasses under the counter. Uh, here. Very good. This is better than I thought it would be. Much better. You know what they say. Champagne for my real friends, real pain for my sham friends. <laughs> Do they say that? No, it's something I heard once, and I liked it. This year won't be better, will it? I don't know. Maybe. Okay. Let's finish this, and I'll buy another bottle. For next time. Same time next year? Same time next year. That was Old Lang Syne by John Patrick Bray with Tony Targan as Jim and Darren Ingram as Frank. Hi, my name is John Busser, the playwright of You Went There, and welcome to the one-year anniversary show of the Theatrical Shenanigans podcast, the most fun you can have doing any kind of shenanigans that won't involve the police. Theatrical Shenanigans presents You Went There by John Busser. Come on, you gotta hustle. Jeez, that was way outside. What are you swinging at? What are you, Javier Baez? <laughs> oh, nice throw. I could bounce that with my eyes closed. Strike th What do you mean, strike three? That was way outside. Gordon, oh Gordon, where's my hunk of hunk of burning man? Where the hell do you think I am? I'm in my chair watching the Mets suck. Ugh. Jesus, what the hell, Janice? Oh, come on, lover boy, pucker up for me. Mm -hmm. Are you drunk or something? Oh, I'm drunk, all right. Drunk on love for my husband. Is this a reverse menopause thing? You're one of those kleptosexuals or something, right? I'm not a nymphomaniac, Gordon, or a klepto-whatever, if that even is such a thing. Then why are you interrupting my Mets game? I have so few pleasures in life. Remember when I used to give you pleasure when we pleasured each other? Ah, oh, jeez, honey, I just ate. I want to relive those times, you sexy man. S sexy? <laughs> Janice, I'm sitting here in my underwear in a bathrobe. What's sexy about that? Happy anniversary, sweetheart. Anniversary? Anniversary? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Did, did I forget? Yes, you did. But it's all right. You can make it up to me the way you did back then. Wait, you want me to... Propose to you again? Propose to me? No. Why would I want you to do that again? Yeah, I was wondering why I did it the first time, too. What was that? I said I'm wondering what I did wrong the first time. Nothing! You were absolutely sensational. I remember I kept tripping over my tongue. There was nothing wrong with your tongue that night. Now give Mama some sugar. Uh, Janice! 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 Jeez, come up for air, will ya? This isn't our anniversary. Remember I had to give my Knicks tickets away because you wanted to marry during the playoffs? Wrong time of year. I don't care about our wedding anniversary, you silly boy. Then 
What the hell anniversary are you talking about? You don't remember? No, I, d I, I don't. I don't remember. What anniversary? Honey, it's the anniversary of when, you know. Know what? Oh, Gordon, you know. Uh, I really wish I did, Janice. It's the anniversary of when you went down there. Down where? Down there. There is kind of vague. Gordon, when you went to, you know, Bush country. Australia? My bush country, Gordon. Do I have to draw you a map to my panties? Oh. 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 Oh, that, that's an anniversary date? A very important one. Uh, I never kept track. I did. Uh, okay. So, what do you get someone for that anniversary? Like a, a tote bag or something? I told you, Gordon, you can make it up to me another way. I know you know how. What? Now? The date only comes once a year, darling. I think we can do better. But it's like the top of the seventh inning. Gordon, this is important. Dr. Thomas, my therapist, says it's one of the most important indicators of sexual compatibility in married couples there is. Going down there? Most important. And she's a doctor, so she would know. So I guess that means that you'll... You know, take a trip to... <laughs> to where, Gordon? You know, the the Washington Monument. My Washington Monument? That's what you're calling it? Well, what do you call it? Leaning Tower? The Leaning Tower of Pisa? Emphasis on leaning. Yeah. I'll have you know, you could run an American flag up this bad boy. Yeah, at half-mast. Uh, that's for when somebody dies. Then let's honor your libido, which was lost to us oh so many years ago. The reports of my libido's death have been greatly exaggerated. Then put your money where my muff is, or are you just all talk and no tongue? Give me two minutes to brush and floss, then I'll show you I can go walk about bush country with the best of them. Mm, you got it, baby! Whoa, 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 wait, uh, what about me? What about you? Don't you want to, you know, go get some pizza? Pizza? You want to eat pizza first? No, I said pizza. You know I said pizza. You know, like, take in the sights, see the tower. Sorry, I better not. Dr. Thomas told me in no uncertain terms that marriage isn't something to play around with. She said, and I quote, there's a lot at stake here, so don't blow it. Is that right? And she's a doctor, so she would know. Want to hear a second opinion? I thought you were getting out the Listerine. First things first. I want to know if you're going to come through on my anniversary date. I promise, Gordon. Just as long as we make a side trip to Viagra Falls first. Then you have to call it the Washington Monument. I'll even let you put a flag on it. Crikey! See you in the line down under, honey. Happy anniversary, baby. That was You Went There by John Busser, with Jackie Priscorn as Janice and Jeff Priscorn as Gordon. Hi, this is Nora Louise Saran, and you're listening to No Theatre Critics Were Harmed in the Writing of This Play. Playwright and producer Rachel Feeney Williams is a wonder. She's full of energy, and her podcast shows it. Some really great discussions, great quality, really fun, and quite a variety of pieces as well. So just like her own writing, you'll find what you're looking for on this podcast. So settle in and listen to Theatrical Shenanigans. Theatrical Shenanigans presents No Theatre Critics Were Harmed in the Writing of This Play by Nora Louise Saran Shit! Shit, shit! That's not what I meant. That's not what I meant at all. I told you to stop replying to trolls. I'm not replying to a troll. It's a theatre critic. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Just stop. I can't. It's just a theatre critic. Let it go. 
I've insulted him. So? I'm not like that. I don't want him thinking that I'm like that. It's like when I drove too close to the car ahead of me yesterday. I just spaced out for a minute, and then there I am, bearing down on some old bitty ahead of me, going exactly the speed limit, and I come across as a... (sighs) We've gone over this. I know. What he thinks about you is his business. Just apologise and move on. I don't have the words. You're a writer. Write. I did. And look what I said. What did you say? I said... (sighs) Never mind. I can't repeat it. It was the context. I basically insulted his profession. He's a theatre critic. He'll get over it. But what if he doesn't? What do you care? What if he happens to review the one and only play I end up ever staging in my entire career? He'll see the name. Something will click, and one quick Google search later, he'll remember. Well, then delete your account. Nothing dies on the internet. Except your career. Ha ha ha. (sighs) Just move on. Write about it. Okay, I will. Good idea. Thanks. That was... No theatre critics were harmed in the writing of this play by Nora Louise Saran, with Dana Hall as writer and Andrea Richardson as reader. Hello, I'm Deborah A. Cole, a playwright from Lawrence, Kansas, USA. Theatrical shenanigans is a true wonder. Playwrights, actors, producers, directors, and anyone who loves theatre should download and subscribe and give a listen. You won't be sorry. It's been a true honor to be a part of the entire process. Now, Theatrical Shenanigans presents my short play, By the Short Hairs. Theatrical Shenanigans presents By the Short Hairs by Deborah A. Cole. I can't believe you did it. I did it. You are amazing. It looks so good on you. I've had long hair my entire life. It was time for a big change. I would worry that my head shape would be all funky underneath all this mess. I was a little nervous too, but not bad, right? It's adorable. I I love it. So so clean and, and fresh. No. Oh, no, 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 you didn't. Tell me this is a joke. Jack, what are you doing? Oh, my God, I can see your scalp. We've been looking at yours for the last five years, Jack, and we didn't complain. But I'm a guy. I can't help it. Baldness runs in my family. Well, I guess it runs in mine now, too. Big mistake. You had the prettiest long hair, Virginia. Why would you do such a thing? I like it. It's freeing. Please tell me you're going to grow it back out. What will your clients say? Cute haircut, Virginia? No, the men won't. I can guarantee it. And can I also say, there goes your dating life. Excuse me? I don't know a guy alive who'd be attracted to a woman with a buzz cut. I mean, Will Smith punched that guy in front of everyone for making fun of his bald wife. But my guess is that deep down he agreed with him. First of all... She has alpecia, so stop. And second of all, I don't make decisions about my hair, my makeup, or my clothing to please our male clients, potential dates, or you. Well, say goodbye to meeting your sales quota and your sex life. Jack Marshall's office. This is Donna. How can I help you? Yes. Absolutely. I'll let him know. HR wants to talk to you, Jack. Are you kidding me? How the hell? Thanks, Donna. I saw you typing. I got you, girl. My husband has controlled my hair for years and Jack doesn't pay me enough to listen to it round here. Hmm. How do you think I would look as a redhead? Stunning. I'm going to need the name of your stylist. That was By the Short Hairs by Deborah A. Cole, with Kerry Freighter as Jack, Margaret Ashley as Virginia, and Jilly Fick as Donna. 
Hey everybody, my name is George Sabio, and this is a short piece that I've had sitting in my brain for a while now. It's for every actor and director who's ever had one of those <laughs> difficult rehearsal days where nothing seems to go right. I want to thank Rachel for asking me to include this piece. You know, she works extremely hard to produce theatrical shenanigans, and it's evident in the quality of the episodes. In its first two seasons alone, theatrical shenanigans has accomplished quite a lot, highlighting dozens of playwrights and bringing their work to new audiences. Here's hoping there will be many, many more seasons to come. Thanks, Rachel. Theatrical Shenanigans presents Deconstructing Oneself by George Sapio. With great regret. You can do regret. I've seen you do regret. Your regret is completely regretful. Massively regretful. With great delight. Pretty much laid out, isn't it? Saves us a lot of work. With great sadness. Think of it this way. If we do it badly, it's the playwright's fault. Look, we can say he wrote it for us to do this way. He wrote in these directions for practically every line. Maybe he wants it done exactly the way he wrote it. Actors translate scripts. We are supposed to get the emotional directions from the lines themselves. Don't you worry about how we're being used? I have an audition for a food product this weekend. It pays real money. I'm going to worry about that. This must be a new playwright. No experienced one would ever think of writing in every emotional direction. It's insulting, demeaning. It's only the new ones that think it's part of the job. Really? You need to do more TV. Look at this. The line is, I can't believe I won the lottery, preceded by, with great surprise. Just do it. Stop kvetching. With great annoyance. What's the line for that? This is crap. I don't see that in there. No, it's me speaking. For real, this is crap. Crap pays. Very well sometimes. She said with great lack of patience. Is that all you care about? Getting paid? I'm an actor. I care about making rent. I care about eventually upgrading from ramen noodles and frozen corn. Aside from the massive cultural enlightenment I'm experiencing, getting paid is why I'm here. With great hunger. Cut it out already. No, it's in here. Page three. Oh my God, am I hungry? Okay, fine, whatever. Just run with the motivation. Grab your check, then go audition for the National Theater. I'm sure Ian McKellen needs a night off from Beckett. Who? You're kidding. You shall not take the actor God's name in vain. Can you just do this so we can go home? I'm sorry, okay? Thank you. She said with great... Great. Wait. Relief. Thank you. Uh, what is it with that line? You miss it every time. It's critical. The whole reveal depends on it. I know. I'm sorry. Relief. Say it with me. Relief. Relief. Together. Not say it with me. It's say it together. Ah, shit. Sorry. Look, this stupid play is hard enough to do without all the postmodern nonsense thrown in. Hold. What? Why? I got it right. Yeah, I know you did. The playwright just texted me a second ago. It's now added instead of thrown in. What? When did that change? It says it sounds more impactful. Shit. Take it from the top. Again. That was Deconstructing Oneself by George Sapio, with Jackie Priscorn as one, Dana Hall as two, Deborah A. Cole as three, Rachel Feeney-Williams as four, and George Sapio as five. Hello, I'm Tony Vale, and I'm thrilled to be a contributor to Theatrical Shenanigans, both as a playwright and a panel member. Credit must go to our host, Rachel Feeney-Williams, for having the vision to set up this excellent facility and for sustaining it. When it comes to writing my plays, the title is all important. Sometimes an idea can be sparked by the title, whereas on other occasions, the title comes from the text. With Ghostwriter, it was a case of deciding who was the ghost and who was the writer or whether they were one and the same. I'll leave you to decide whether I made the right choice. 
Theatrical Shenanigans presents Ghostwriter by Tony Vale. How are you getting on? Dad! Oh, God, I wish you wouldn't keep creeping up on me like that. Sorry, love. Do you know what the time is? Um, 2.17am, according to the clock on this computer. You've got to get up for work in the morning. I know, but I'm in free flow with this chapter. At least I was until you frightened the life out of me. Oh, sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't have the life frightened out of me. It was squeezed out by the water. Well, we always said that going out in that boat would be the death of you. One of the benefits of having moved into the afterlife is that I don't have to put up with the perpetual nagging by you and your mother. We merely made suggestions for your general well-being, that's all. Such as don't forget to put on your life jacket. Anyway, why are you wandering about at this time of night? I always got up at 2am when I was alive, and I can't get out of the habit of doing it now that I've passed through the curtains. I thought passing water was your problem. We never talk about our health issues up there. It's like being in prison. You never ask why someone is serving a sentence. Well, you don't have to if they're in the murder wing. I'm here to help you with your book. It is the story of my life, after all. I'd have given up after the first few paragraphs. It's my gift to Mum, and to your memory. Where have you got up to? Uh, When you came out of the Air Force and started training as a bus driver. It was just before you were born. I remember your mum bringing you on the bus when you were a few weeks old. It was the only time you ever slept. Things haven't changed much, have they? I've always been a night owl. It's a good job I didn't get a job as a milkman. You and Mum got married six months before I was born. You were always good at maths, too. Does it bother you? Why should it? I love couples leaving until well after the baby's born these days before they get married. Your nan never got over the shame of her daughter getting into trouble, as she called it. But Granny didn't seem to mind. My mum was one of ten kids. Your mum, being an only child, seemed to have a different perspective when it came to producing babies. Oh, you're not going to put that in the book, are you? I haven't decided yet. It would upset your mum. Oh, do you think so? Yes, I do. That's the benefit of being able to talk to you after you've gone to meet your maker. Well, that's a myth. What is? Going to meet your maker. I've been up there nearly three years now and I still haven't met him or her or them. Oh, could it be a her? Nobody seems to know for sure. Can I put that in the book? Of course you can't. I told you, it's privileged information you're getting. You can't go sharing it with the rest of the world, willy-nilly. Politicians are always doing it. I left politics behind me when I went up there. You can't avoid politicians, surely. The place must be overrun with them. They never get any further than the declaration of interest when everyone has to say if they're ever knowingly told a lie. And how did you get past that stage? Cheeky. The only lies I've ever told are the ones to protect the innocent. (laughs) Like when you told Mum that her hair was lovely when she came back from the hairdressers, even though it was always a disaster. A little untruth is perfectly acceptable. It was the hairdresser who was the criminal in that case for taking her money under false pretenses. You really did love her, didn't you? I thought the world of her. And I still do doesn't mean that I'll be making an appearance in her presence, though. Why not? That's something I wanted to give exclusively to you. That's not one of your little untruths, is it? You've always been special to me. And always will be. Besides, you're the writer and I'm the ghost. We were made for each other. That was... Ghostwriter by Tony Vale, with Amy Wilson as Sarah and Patrick Hibben as Sarah's dad. Hello, my name is Cole Hunter Zubek. I am a Michigan based playwright and actor. And the thing I love most about the Theatrical Shenanigans podcast is you can hear the amount of care and dedication that goes into producing each play. And that's what I love about it. With that being said, I am very happy to present the theatrical shenanigans production of my short play, A Love Letter to Stu Mocker. Theatrical Shenanigans presents 
A Love Letter to Stu Macker by Cole Hunter Zubak. Hello? Hello, Jesse. Who is this? Do you like scary movies? Listen, asshole. I've seen the scream movies. I know this game. I know. I can see it playing on the TV right now. Deacon, is this you? Knock it off. You know I watch them this time of year. Want me to prove it? Go ahead. Stu is harassing Randy at the video store. Okay, listen, motherfucker. Knock this shit off or I'm calling the police. Oh, you wouldn't want to do that. They would never make it here in time. Milo, this better be you. Stop playing. Who's playing? Do you still have the spare key? Are you in here? Better figure it out. Find me before I find you. <laughs> Is this how you get off? By scaring people at home all by themselves? Oh. Don't think it's Milo anymore? I've seen this movie before. I'm not falling into any traps. Ah! <laughs> Jumpy, aren't we? Fuck you! You're getting warmer. Milo, if that's you, you're never getting any ever again. Oh, colder. The closet. So unoriginal. Who said anything about a closet? Gotcha! Jesus Christ, Milo! You asshole! <laughs> Come open the front door. What if I don't? Did you knock on the door? I'm not even at the door yet. I, I Here. Just it. I swear I heard a knock on the... Closet. Did you let Deacon in? No, I'm, I'm here alone. Jesse... What's going on? Milo? I think someone's in the closet. <coughs> that was A Love Letter to Stu Macker by Cole Hunter Zubak, with Perdita Lawson as Jesse and Darren Ingram as Ghost and Milo. And with that terrifying ending, our one year anniversary special comes to an end. I hope you enjoyed the 13 plays you heard today and I would like to offer my thanks to the 12 other playwrights as well as the amazing voice actors who made this special possible. If you're out there and you're listening to the show and you would like to show your support, you can do so in many ways. You can give us a like, follow, comment or share on our Facebook or Instagram page. You can treat us to a pre-show cocktail on our Buy Me A Coffee page or you can buy one of our theatrical shenanigans mugs or sports bottles on our Etsy page. I would also like to thank you, our audience, for listening to this special and hope you can join us as Theatrical Shenanigans continues into 2024, starting with its second mini shenanigans series on the 7th of January and running weekly until the end of March before we start Season 3. We also have our monthly episodes of The Panel Presents for you to enjoy, as well as another special on the 8th of March to celebrate International Women's Day. So here's hoping you can join us for all of that. In the meantime, though, I've been Rachel Feeney-Williams, this is Theatrical Shenanigans, bringing down the curtain and saying, I hope you can join us next time. Theatrical Shenanigans, part of an RFW Scripts production, found on Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, and anywhere else you can find your podcasts. Music is written and produced by Chris Cody.